Okay, I'm Julia Yeomans, I'm from Oxford. Um, and what I've decided to do is talk about single particle sort of active matter and particularly the hydrodynamics of active matter. Because tomorrow in my talk I'm going to talk about dense active matter and I realized that if I was going to talk about that today I'd have to go through all the introductory stuff again and you didn't want to hear it twice. So I thought I'd talk about, um, first of all, the hydrodynamics of swimming microorganisms and start from the beginning because some of you I know are just starting as graduate students. And so just some of the very basic things of how microswimmers swim. And then I'll talk about things swimming with particles, how microswimmers stir the fluid and how they move small particles and then bigger particles around. And then I'll get on to something which is unpublished, which is some work we've been doing on how things swim in dense macro, macro molecular fluids, basically in gunge, okay? So when they're trying to get through things which have lots and lots of polymers in them. So hopefully the first bit is background that everyone should know about if they're working on this field. And apologies to those of you that already know, so ask lots of questions, all right, when I get it wrong. And then stuff about these traces, which is sort of in the middle. Um, it's published work, but I'll say at the end, there's all sorts of things which we don't really understand, which are worth thinking about, and then this new work at the end. I don't know how long that's going to take, if it's not long enough to fill up my space. First of all, we've got these wonderful volunteers who are going to give talks, because I thought it'd be nice for you to see how people are actually using these ideas uh, in their research. And then I've got some work on pancake bouncing, drop bouncing, which I can talk about after the break if, uh, if, if we have time. So please ask questions. It's meant to be a master class, not a lecture. It's uh, far too late in the day to give a lecture. So I'd really, really like you to interrupt and ask me questions. All right, so let's start. Where am I going to stand? So this is what we're on about. Swimming bacteria, the tiny things which swim. And I guess the first question is, why are we making a big fuss about these and not just taking a load of graduate students and chucking them in a swimming pool and measuring things and seeing what's going on? And of course, the answer is that these are very tiny. And because they're very tiny, we're going to talk about swimming at low Reynolds number. And swimming at low Reynolds number is special. And there are two things that are special about it. First of all, there's something called the scallop theorem, and that answers the question, when can something swim at low Reynolds number? And that's the most famous one that everyone's heard of. But then there's something else which actually ends up being much more useful, and that's what does the flow field look like around the swimmer? When the thing swims, it sets up flows, it sets up velocity fields around it, and we know quite a lot about those velocity fields, and it helps us to do calculations and understand what's going on. So, everyone recognize that? Yep, Navier-Stokes equation. Um, v is the velocity, all right? P is the pressure, the pressure there and the force of the driving terms. This is the inertial term, and then this one here is the viscous term. And the way to think about them is the inertial term tells you about how momentum is transported through the fluid, and then the viscous term tells you how momentum is dissipated in the fluid. And so if you're swimming in the swimming pool and you stop moving, you glide for a bit, and that's your inertia moving you along, and then eventually you come to rest, and that's the viscosity which is slowing you down. If you had a load of fluid, a sort of infinite amount of fluid, and it was moving, and you left it for a long time, what would happen to it? Anybody? Can you repeat your question? Sorry? Right, a load of fluid, no, no, no edges, an infinite amount of fluid, and it's moving, all right, for a long time. What's going to happen to it at long times? It's going to come to rest. No, actually, no. No? No. Okay, because what viscosity does is it gets rid of velocity gradients and it doesn't get rid of velocities. So what will actually happen, and this is weird, and it took me about two years of lecturing this stuff to realize, is actually this will just 
so it, it, the velocity will get spread out, so it's all going at the same speed, but it won't actually come to rest. And that's weird, isn't it? Because, I mean, you're quite right. We all know that it does come to rest, and that's just because you've got boundaries on a real fluid, and it's um, momentum being lost at the boundaries. So my example was, was very, very weird, really. OK, so then the Reynolds number... The Reynolds number tells me the ratio of this inertial term to the viscous term. Okay. And the Reynolds number, if you work it out, comes out to be a velocity, just some sort of velocity scale, times a length scale, divided by a viscosity. And that Reynolds number will cross you over from high Reynolds number to low Reynolds number. Okay, so high Reynolds number, what happens at high Reynolds number? Turbulence, right? So this lot here is high Reynolds number. Lots of vorticity, um, lots of splashing, lots of chaos. And at low Reynolds number, which probably those of you that are doing experiments are doing your experiments with, it's laminar flow. Low Reynolds number, you have laminar flow. It's really difficult to get anything to mix. And you get, I think I put that same picture in again, this sort of bacterial swimming. High Reynolds number is large velocities, large length scales, and low viscosities. <coughs> Bacteria at the other limit, the low Reynolds number limit, because typical velocities are 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. Typical lengths are about 10 to the minus 5 meters, and viscosity comes out about 10 to the minus 6 in sensible units. So the Reynolds numbers are really small, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. And so to a good approximation, they're zero. And we can just look at the zero Reynolds number limit. And in that limit, you can forget about the inertial term, which is great, because you get left with the Stokes equation. And the Stokes equation is a good thing. And it's a good thing because it's linear. Linear in the velocity. And if things are linear, everything gets much easier. And what's uh, helpful as well is that if you go away from that zero Reynolds number limit, you can prove that it isn't a singular limit. You can prove that you go away from the zero Reynolds number physics slowly. And so it's OK to take small Reynolds numbers and call them very close to zero. OK. So have you seen this movie about um, when people put dye in a fluid and mix it up? Has anyone not seen it? All right, I'll show you afterwards because it does go on a bit, all right? What you do is you put three bits of dye in a fluid of different colors and you mix them up by moving this round and round, okay? And then you go back in the other direction and the three blobs untwist themselves and you end up with three separate blobs of fluid again. And the reason is that at low Reynolds number, the flow is reversible. If you do something to a fluid at low Reynolds number and then do it backwards in exactly the same direction, you get back to where you're starting from. You can see it from the equations because there's no time dependence in these equations. Okay, so... This means you have problems if you're a little animal, because if you're trying to swim, you have your swimming stroke, okay, and you do something like that, right, and you move over here and everything's fine, and then you do it back again, which you have to in a stroke, because you have to get back to where you started from, and you just move back again to exactly where you were to start with. So you spend an awful lot of energy not getting anywhere. And that's the scallop theorem. The Scarab theorem says that in order for things to swim, their swimming stroke must be different forwards and backwards in time. OK, so how do they do it? How do these little creatures, little bacteria, make sure their swimming stroke <coughs> is different forwards and backwards in time? Yeah? Exactly, yeah. Flexible, usually tails, but... Yeah, <laughs> would be <laughs> mine, yeah. They have a wave going down their tail. 
uh, I guess sperm cells or um, E. coli have a wave going down this tail and the wave has a direction to it. You can tell if you look at a wave which way it's going. And similarly, you can also have ones with helical tail, with sort of hooks like this, um, no, hooks spiraled, helixes like that, because a helix again has a handedness to it. And so that gives you a direction. So the reason these bacteria look like this, look this strange sort of way, is, is because of the scallop theorem, because they have to, if they're going to move, they have to have some way of doing it, and they do it by designing their tails like this. Similarly here, this is, these are cilia. Cilia are sort of um, nature's pumps, if you like. They sit on the surface, and they push the fluid around. And so they're the way, for example, they move fluid around your lungs or your body. And they have to have a stroke. It wouldn't work if they just did this. So what they do is they go in this direction and they sort of go down to the surface and come back like this. So these are some simulations we did a long time ago now, right? Swimmers which just do this. Are they swimmers? Are they going to be swimmers? No, because, you know, this is the same forwards and backwards in time. So then we put two of them together. How do these guys... Let's see if we can get them all to move. All right. These are little dumbbells doing that, obeying the Stokes equation. You can't see them doing this because we haven't got the, the movie uh, that. No. Anyone know why they might move? That one's, this one's fun. I like the way this one dances. OK. Does anybody know how they? Where are they are? Are they depending on the surface? Uh, I would say some curvature. Uh, the that would certainly work, but yeah, these, <laughs> yeah, that certainly would work. These are, these, I'm afraid, I'm a theoretical physicist, so these are just sitting there in infinite space in a fluid. So we're just solving the Stokes equations. So how could we get this? Yeah? Okay. No, there aren't any in this simulation. Um, Usually with microswimmers, we don't worry too much about thermal fluctuations because they're micron-sized, but you're certainly at the edge of where you have to. Maybe yeah. when uh, one moves, uh, it changes the velocity field around him, so the, the, the other one has, of course, the flow from the, the first. Uh, and moving, uh, by the fact that they are not in a symmetrical uh, position, uh, on the, I mean, they could be in any Different not quite, not quite. It's certainly, I mean, that's why it's doing it, because this one's setting up a flow field which is affecting this one. So would it work if they were going like this? No, because it's symmetric. Exactly. So what do you have to do with them to make it work? Make that's phase. it, phase. It's the phase. We've made a phase difference between them, and immediately they start flowing, because that phase difference, as long as it's not pi, means that it's different forwards and backwards in time. Okay, so that's the, that's the scallop theorem. That's the first thing about this low Reynolds number swimming. That answers the question, can something swim? So now let's ask, and, and you were saying that you've got this flow field around the swimmer. A swimmer sets up a flow field. As it moves, it pushes the fluid, and so it has a velocity field around it. What does that velocity field look like? That's the question we're going to ask. OK, so these are the equations we have to solve. These are Stokes equations. Gradient of pressure is viscosity del squared V plus F. If there is a point force in the fluid, or if you're an experimentalist, if you have a tiny colloid and you're pulling it through the fluid, same story, OK, then you can work out the velocity due to that tiny force at the origin. Sorry, not tiny force, point force at the origin, force of, 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 of magnitude f at the origin. This is called the Green's function of the Stokes equation for the more mathematical among you. OK, it's just force over 8 pi um, viscosity. That's the unit tensor. R is the distance away that you're looking. This is just um, the didactic pro product of vectors over, over R cubed. That's not trivial to work out, but it's not hard. It's about five pages in a textbook. 
Okay, so I can't really do it very easily on the board. I think the thing I sent out to you has probably got the right references in, and if not, I can tell you. Um, so it's, it's not a totally trivial calculation, but it's, it's not too bad. You could all do it if you sat down for a couple of hours to work it out. So what does it look like, the flow field? Well, it sort of looks like you'd expect, right? This is the little force, and the flow field decays going away from it. These colours show the decay, and the direction is sort of in the direction of the force. That makes a lot of sense. Take a colloid, pull it through the fluid, and that's... Whoops! Which direction am I going? That's the sort of flow field that you're going to get. OK, but that's not going to work for these tiny swimmers. And the reason is that if you're a swimmer, there's no one there to pull you. You can't have an external force acting on you. You can't have a net force acting on you. Because what you're doing is you yourself are making yourself move by pushing the fluid. So typically what will happen is a swimmer will move by exerting a force forward on the fluid and backward at its tail. A sort of stress like this, which is pushing the fluid away. So this is just Newton. Okay, he can't have a force without a reaction force. And so for a swimmer, at any one point in time, all the forces must be balanced. They can't have a net force acting on that swimmer. So what's the flow field going to look like? Well, you're sort of used to this story, um, I think, can't you? Can anyone see where you've, an, another bit of physics where you've seen it before when you're an undergraduate? Exactly. Right. So, you know, with a charge, you have around it um, a potential which goes like 1 over R. But if you don't have a net charge, you have a plus and minus charge. That's a dipole. And the dipole has a potential which goes like 1 over R squared. And how do you work it out? Well, you just add up the um, potential due to the plus charge and the potential due to the minus charge and the leading term cancels out, the 1 over r term cancels out, and you get the next term along, the 1 over r squared term. And you would have um, been made to do that calculation as second year undergraduates, if you were chemists, I think. Yeah? Sorry, physicists, if you were physicists. <laughs> chemists, that, chemists can't do it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's a chemist. I'm always rude about chemists. <laughs> He's rude about physicists to balance. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's do that. Um, if I do exactly the same calculation here, if I take, sorry, just, um, yeah, spare trace. If I do exactly the same sort of calculation here, and I take that due to a force going in one direction and a force going in the other direction, so here's one force and here's my other force, and I work out the flow field of the swimmer here, OK, then I have to add up my two Stress, uh, Stokes, as they're called, these two green functions with a different sign. So now if I was really mean, I'd say, right, we're going to spend the next half an hour doing that, but luckily I've done it for you. And what you come out with is a nice formula like this. This is the velocity. goes as 1 over r squared. That's what I'd expect because it's a dipolar velocity. It goes like F times L, so that's the dipole strength, just like in the electromagnetic case, you had charge times the distance between the charges. Here, I've got the force times L, which I should have said was the distance between the swimmers. And then I have an angular term, which you can't guess unless you actually do the calculation. OK. So that's what the field looks like, the velocity field, a long way away from a swimmer. Let's draw it. OK. It falls off as 1 over r squared. That means it's sort of yellow here and blue there and dark blue there. So it falls off quite quickly as 1 over r squared. And then you have this angular dependence. All right, if I plot 3 cos squared theta minus 1, what you find is that if um, F times L is negative, the swimmer pulls fluid in from its ends and pushes it out from its sides. 
and that's called a puller or a contractile swimmer. This one here, if FL has the opposite sign, if it's negative, uh, pushes fluids out from the ends and pulls it in from the sides. Hello. So does the philosophy field only have a radial component? Yes. Okay. Yes. The f you have to be a little bit careful because remember what I'm, what I'm working out here is the far field velocity. Near the swimmer, it gets more complicated. Has to, otherwise the swimmer wouldn't swim. Um, but, uh, but a long way away, the asymptotic large distance flow field looks like this. Anyone got any other questions? OK, yeah? yeah so I wonder, if, if, if this is a dipole, what does a quadrupole look like? Because I, if I look at this, I would say, OK, I see sort of four lobes. <laughs> this would be a quadrupole. Um, you, you, can't, you can't extrapolate that particular theta dependence from the analogy you're used to with electromagnetism. But I'll show you a quadrupole in a minute. Yeah. OK, other questions? Can anyone see um, the deliberate mistake here? Have I? Yeah. The what? The, the direction of the red line? No, no, that's fine. Um, it, well, I had, yes, it's almost like that. See, what I've done is what I meant to do is um, switch over the arrows from pointing this way to pointing outwards. All right, that's what I have to do to go from extensile to contractile. And what I've also done is switch over the shape of these lobes. And I have to admit that's just plain laziness because I couldn't be bothered to redraw the whole thing again. So actually, the angular dependence isn't quite right on that side there. Um, I could actually, could I just do it? Yes, I could just put it up like that, couldn't I? And then I'd be all, no, I couldn't because then it would still be coming in at the ends and out from the sides. So I, I can't cheat that way. I'm afraid that's me being lazy. OK. And it matters, actually, whether these things are pullers or pushers. It, ma it makes a big difference. You can imagine if one of them's aiming at a surface and it's pushing fluid out from the front of it, it, be it interacts in a different way from the surface as if it's pulling fluid in towards it. And so you'll find people talk a lot about the difference between pullers and pushers. The other thing to notice, which I'm going to probably talk about tomorrow, if I have time, is that these things have pneumatic symmetry. This flow field has a pneumatic symmetry. Anybody know what I mean by pneumatic symmetry? Not the orientation on the dipole. Mm, a bit like a liquid crystal. You know these liquid crystals with long, thin molecules, which have a certain special direction. If you look here, it's symmetric around that line, isn't it? And that's what I mean by pneumatic symmetry. It has a special direction. Uh, you can see the difference here. You've got this symmetry around this line that is the same. This, it's the same forwards and backwards. Whereas here, with the, di with the, with the monopole, with, the, with just a single force, it's different this way and that way because there's definitely a net flow in this direction. And that special symmetry is what basically does all the physics that I'm going to be on about when I'm talking tomorrow, the idea of active turbulence in these dense systems. OK, so, so does it work? So these are experiments. So we want to look at the experiments and see if we can actually measure these flow fields. And we as very much someone else, and in particular graduate students and postdocs in Ray Goldstein's group, um, actually measured the flow fields. And this is the flow field around E. coli. And these are really difficult experiments, because for a start, the E. coli won't stay still. And secondly, you can imagine that they are tiny. And so if you're trying to do experiments, you have to put in tracer particles to follow the flow field. The tracer particles have to be even tinier. And so thermal fluctuations are horrible. OK, anyone work with tracer particles here? Yeah, I'm sure some of you do. Do you have trouble with thermal fluctuations? Um, not so much. I'm, I'm a bit lucky, and my particles are a lot larger. <laughs> OK, yeah. These are about half a micron, and you're really on the edge of what you can do. So this is actually about 100 E. coli, all of which have had their flow fields measured, and then you've sort of put them on top of each other from place to place. And you can see 
very nicely that here you have a dipolar flow field. It's pushing fluid out from the ends and it's pulling it in from the sides. Only works in the far field, very close to, you know, all hell lets loose in here. It's really difficult to predict what's going on. This one is clammy. This one's clammy demonas. This one does breaststroke. Okay. This is its flow field. And you can see that if you look a long way away, okay, then this one pushes fluid out from its sides. You can see the arrows going outwards here. And it pulls it in from its ends. Okay, so that's like a, a pusher. Sorry, puller, that one, puller, contractile system, yeah. But round here, you know, it really isn't like that at all. So you really have to get a long way away into the far flow field. And that's because this one does have a large quadrupole. And I think I've got a picture later on on how you can match it if you take the 1 over r squared term and the 1 over r cubed term in this, what's called this multipole expansion. And then there's this one, which is nice because it's pretty. Okay, this one's Volvox. Volvox moves by having little hairs on its surface, cilia on its surface. So it's sort of doing this, you know, little, little rowers all the way around. Um, and if you work out its flow field, which is much easier because it's actually quite a lot bigger, it's about 100 microns, this one. Okay, what sort of flow field is this one? Actually, it's going this way. What's that one? That's a Stokes that, right? This is the one. Somehow there's a force on that. Okay. Does anyone know what the force might be? Gravity. Exactly. It's big. This one's 100 microns. Gravity matters. It spends its time swimming upwards against gravity. So the fact that this one has a field um, like the flow which was going in a certain direction, which people have been calling a Stokes that, and that's just another name for the Green's function of this um, <coughs> Of, of, of the Stokes equation. <coughs> All right, you can see uh, this is very much a, a Stokes slope. It's a good hint there, isn't it, of what the force is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I just wanted to say a little bit more about how this multipole expansion works. So, what I'm going to say with this slide is um, just just the same thing again in slightly different languages because it doesn't hurt. What you're doing is that here's your swimmer or several swimmers and they're exerting forces. So you have a distribution of forces down here. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the velocity field a long way away. And you're doing it as an expansion in 1 over r, 1 over the distance. And that's called a multipole expansion. It's exactly what you do in electromagnetism. So if this has a net force, then what you're going to get is that the leading term is 1 over r, and you're going to get this Stokeslet. If it doesn't, and the swimmers don't, because of this having to have equal and opposite forces, generically, you'll pick up the next term down. And the next term down is this dipole, dipole term, which I've been talking about. It's also called a stresslet. It's actually slightly more complicated than the electromagnetism case, because we're dealing with forces, which are vectors, rather than charges, which are scalars. So you could also have a torque, a net torque, for this force distribution. If you have a net torque, you get a thing called a rotlet, which is, again, a 1 over r squared term. And then here's the quadrupole one someone was mentioning. If, you, if, if those, by chance, happen to be 0, you'll pick up the quadrupole. And the quadrupole um, appears if the, if, if the creature has um, an asymmetry between its front and its back. You can also have a solution of that at that order, which is what's called a source dipole, and that comes in if your creature has a finite volume. So those of you that are doing active colloids, I think, would pick up a, 
um, a source dipole. And then you can have a rotlet dipole. What, what this is is equal opposing, opposing torques. Because what we know is that if we actually have a swimmer, we're not allowed this stokeslet. Yep. And we're not allowed the rocklet either because you can't have a net torque. Again, you've always got to have equal and opposite torques, just like you have to have equal and opposite forces. And so that means that you get this rocklet um, dipole as the leading term. Those are the two that you can't have. And if anybody wants to do the maths properly, it's done in here, which was some lecture notes I did from a, from a while back. Okay, but it's, it's not easy to do it um, on the board. Well, I could do it on the board, but certainly not with slides. Again, it's not hard. That's what you're doing, but it's playing with tensors quite a lot. So, just to show you that it works, this is essentially what I said before. A dipole looks like E. coli. Someone was asking about a quadrupole. If you have a dipole plus a quadrupole, you can actually get these sort of vortices here that you see in the chlamydomonas. If you just have a source doublet, you can look at a get the flow field of an active droplet, and then this one is this, um, this alga that we, that we saw. Yeah. So that's part one, and those are the questions we've answered in part one. Bacteria swim at low Reynolds number, which makes them special. And there are two things which are sort of exciting about them. First of all, the scallop theorem thing. That's why they've got long wavy tails, because they have to propel themselves by some sort of wave. And then the other thing, which actually I think often has much more effect on at least theoretical physics, is that you've got these far flow fields which have this special dipolar symmetry to them. Right, and that's the answer to uh, that's a, that's that means if there's a joke it means you can wake up now because that's the end of that bit and then <laughs> we'll start on the next bit anybody got any questions sorry not very relevant um would you be able to send the slides to us please sorry would yeah. you be able to send the slides to us after? the slides will go up on the I, on the web okay they're actually hard to send because they're quite big the and there's something missing from the slide, oh Sorry, uh, the handout is the Verena lecture notes, yeah. so you can always look them up online. Um, but the slides um, will go on the web automatically because we're, we're all being recorded. Yeah. Good, any other questions? Yeah? Uh, you showed us that the stokes let and stress let kind of modes can exist independently. So can each of the modes exist in some kind of hypothetical creature? <coughs> oh, yes, yes. I mean, in general, a little creature has all the modes. So we're always asking which one's dominant. And of course, it's the one over R to the something, the thing with the smallest something's going to win eventually. Yeah, but close to this expansion hasn't a hope because you've got all the, all the modes added in. Yeah? So is, it also, is it also known uh, why a creature would develop a certain mode? So, so we, is it, it has to do, I guess, with the environment that they're in? <coughs> I mean, you have all these different propulsion systems, but yeah. is one that is uh, superior? Or <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure you're right, it's to do with the environment. That's too biology uh. for me, yeah. <laughs> all we know, generically, mathematically, it has to be dipolar, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And then it, it, it obviously is evolution mm -hmm. makes it fit in some ways, yeah. Well, I mean, like, uh, mathematically, you have an infinite fluid so mm -hmm. that you have no force adding on the fluid, so that you have no... Yeah, the, the stroke stroke slit term goes zero, but normally you have boundaries that you may have exert some force. And um, uh, that may uh, No, the boundaries wouldn't exert a force, they'd just be there. Okay. Okay. I mean they're not gonna actually push the fluid in any way. Yeah, yeah. But certainly yes, you have to worry about the fact that maybe the, the swimmer could push off the boundaries and that's going to make a difference. And we'll see that. I mean that'll be a question when we, when we've got this thing going through a polymer network because it could push 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 off the polymers, perhaps. We've got to ask if that m makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. You talked about the magnetic symmetry of the flow field. Mm -hmm. Do I understand correctly that it's only the far field that has that symmetry? Because otherwise, you couldn't walk forward, right? 
Thank you. Your complete flow field will be the magic. That's right. Locally, um, it, it's, that's a far field story. Right. And if it just had that pneumatic symmetry, you wouldn't obey the scallop theorem. No. So you'd be in a mess. Yeah, that's right. So we, it, it, there really are two different questions, the scallop theorem and what's happening in the far field. Good. OK. Let's move on. Everybody have time to read the joke? Good. <laughs> right. <laughs> right then. Um, OK, so I thought what I'd talk about next is, is this idea of stirring, stirring by microswimmers. And I think the status of this is that we can solve the simple problems. We understand some simple things, but there's an awful lot we don't understand. And, well, hopefully you'll have some good ideas, because what I think is that it's really quite hard to get any further than we've got at the moment, um, because things aren't really generic enough. But let, let me explain to you how far we've got. Um, so these are the questions, OK? Did the microswimmers stir the fluid they're in? And it's sort of pretty obvious the answer is yes, isn't it? Because you know, they're setting up flow fields. Why do they stir it? Any, anybody think of any good reason why that would be a useful thing for a microswimmer to do? Get mm, Exactly. If they wait for nutrition to diffuse to them, diffusion is a very slow process. Um, but if they can sort of stir things up a bit, maybe that is going to help them get food. And then how do they do it? If I put in tracer particles, how are they going to move? So first of all, these are some really quite classic experiments, again, from the Cambridge group. What this is, is you've got a load of swimmers. Um, this is the percentage concentration of swimmers. And then you stick in some tracer particles, and you ask how far have the tracer particles moved after a certain time. So if there are no swimmers in there, this red curve is how far the tracer particles have moved. What, what's the shape of that curve? So it doesn't look like it here because you're on a log-log scale. A Gaussian. Yeah, it has to be a Gaussian, doesn't it? Because, because these things are diffusing around. If you put in swimmers, what you get instead are these other curves, the green one if you put in a few swimmers, and so on and so forth. And these curves are actually very characteristic. You get these long tails. You certainly get more diffusion, yep, but you also get these long tails. You get a few very, very long. Um, the, the tracer particle moves a long way a few times, much more than you'd expect. Certainly isn't Gaussian anymore. And here are some really beautiful pictures, again, quite old. What we're going to see here is a movie in a minute, and the green ones are the swimmers, and the red ones are the tracer particles. Let's see if we can get it to work. OK, so is there anything you notice about the tracer particles? Yeah, they certainly get these long sort of regions where they get dragged. Yeah? What about that one? Um, or these, I oh know, have, have to do it quickly. Um, some loops. loops, yeah. Some of them go in loops. Perhaps, you know, you'd expect some to go in loops because of Brownian motion, but they're more loops maybe than you would expect. And actually, the experimentalist who'd been staring at this said, gosh, there are lots of loops in this system more than we'd expect. OK, so let's try and understand why and then come back at the end and have a look at this and see what we might find. So being theoretical physicists, we started at the beginning and we said, let's have a swimmer which just goes in a straight line from minus infinity to plus infinity. And let's put a tracer particle here. And I can work out the velocity field because I know at least the far field due to that swimmer. How does it move? OK. And the answer is, it does a loop. It moves like this. And the reason is actually extremely obvious, but it took us about six months to catch on. But we got there in the end. OK. And of course, this is the symmetry thing again. Um, it's due to the shape of the flow field, because if I have a tracer particle, well, the swim, if the swimmer moves past a tracer particle, it's like the tracer particle moving past the swimmer. And you can see what it's going to do 
is it's going to be pushed away from the swimmer there, and then when it gets to here, it's going to be pulled in towards the swimmer, and there it's going to be pushed away from the swimmer again. So it's going to go away towards away, and because of the symmetry of this thing, what you're going to do is you're going to end up with it um, here, being pushed away, then it moves towards the swimmer, and then it's pushed back in the other direction. Perhaps it's best to see here, pushed away, pulled towards, pushed away again. And because of the right-left symmetry, I end up with a loop. Which is fine, and then, you know, that's cute. But on the other hand, what we were trying to do is explain enhanced diffusion. And we're in a bit of a mess, aren't we? Because if it's going to diffuse more, and this thing is going round loops, you know, it's going to get back to where it started and we're not going to have any enhanced diffusion. So what's wrong with my argument? The far, the far field, so it's too far, not near the swimmer. So yes. Greater near the swimmer, they can't do a perfect loop. So ah, but why, why not? I mean, you're right, but, but why not? First, because I saw the feature of the PDF, so you are increasing the diffusion and it's impossible with the loop. So also I'm thinking if I have... Uh, a straight line of tracer, I have the swimmer. For sure, one will be uh, transported uh, from the front. So, so this, uh, the, part fi the field is uh, true just far away from, uh, I mean, the part is part mm -hmm. assumption. So the symmetry is true far, but near the, the part field must be really super complex. So That's certainly true, but th there's something else, even with the far field, which is going wrong here. Yeah. Uh, Close to, yes, that happens close to. The particles do tend to get stuck on the swimmers if they're close, and there have been some very recent work showing that. Mm. Well, what I'm assuming here is that the particles stay on the same streamline, on the same flow line. And so what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the field essentially doesn't change with time, and of course, as the swimmer comes past, it does change with time. I have to add the fact that I move from one streamline to another as the thing goes past, OK? And I'll show you in a minute what happens when I do that. All right, so the, the fluid mechanics is very much a far field approximation, both for the reason this gentleman said and also because um, I'm essentially assuming uh, Eulerian rather than Lagrangian fluid mechanics. I'm saying that the particle follows streamlines, and it won't. It'll move between streamlines um, unless its velocity is very, very small. So, what else? Slightly less mathematical story. What's wrong with my swimmer model? So swimmers can also change direction. Exactly. These things don't move in straight lines nicely from minus infinity to plus infinity. Real swimmers will have curved paths, and they will have paths where you get essentially persistent random walks. OK, so what I said was actually right but only right in this very far field limit. And I don't know how to do it mathematically if the trace is closer to the swimmer, so we have to do it numerically. And the person who did it is a, is, um, is a very good postdoc called Henry Shum, who's now uh, in the faculty in University of Waterloo in, in Canada. And what he did is say, right, now this is the swimmer model. The swimmer moving along and the, the tail turns like that. And he did boundary element simulations. And what boundary element simulations are is that you solve Soak's equations, and you solve it so there's no slip on the surface of the swimmer, and you carefully adjust things so that the swimmer is force-free and torque-free, so it's a proper swimmer. And so what we can do is do the same story, have our swimmer come in from minus infinity, um, uh, wrong thing, there we are. Okay, so this is the swimmer path. And let it go through a plane of traces. The mathematicians call this a material sheet. Go through a plane of traces. And then we say, okay, um, the tracer starts here. Here's its path, and it ends up on the blue line. 
And if the tracer starts a long way away from the swimmer, what's going to happen? Okay, is that it gets back almost in a loop, almost a closed loop. Closer to, you can see the loop getting slightly less closed and it ends up actually moving backwards, being pushed backwards by the swimmer. But here what happens is again you get loops, but the loops are much bigger and they're not closed. You get the particle essentially being entrained by the swimmer, being pulled along by the swimmer. And then if it was here, it would be like a seal pushing something along on its nose, which we said over there, okay, and the particle would go all the way here, just perched on the swimmer. So if these swimmers rather nicely went in a straight line, that's the sort of picture that you would get. And we can go back now to these, and we can, we can see that. You'll see it being entrained. You'll see down here, entrainment. Um, well, that's a nice one. I think this one you know, is pulling those along, pulling them along there, pulling these along. And you can also see loops up here. The loops, of course, are not perfect because those loops are tiny and the Brownian motion is, is bad. Okay. Um, if I can stop it in the middle there. There, that's a nice, oh, that's a nice loop up there. There's a nice loop. Okay. So it's a start in terms of understanding how a single swimmer stirs the fluid around it, how it moves tracer particles. But it's then, then we get stuck. I mean, this is very recent work because what I thought I would like to do is, is now ask, let's see what happens if the tracer particles get bigger. Because if the tracer particles get bigger and bigger, <coughs> then essentially you're going to have a swimmer and a colloid, and you're going to end up with a tiny swimmer and a big colloid. That would be the other limit. And, you, and, and then it's more like a, a swimmer interacting with what eventually becomes a flat surface. So, you know, can we see what happens as you go between those limits? And the answer is yes, you can do the simulations. Um, I'll just show you this row, which is the tiny tracer limit, and this row, which is the big tracer limit. Okay. What we can see is here's the swimmer, and what we see is what we expect, entrainment and a bit of a loop. Particle moves, is entrained. This is as the particles get further and further away from the swimmer, you start getting loops. So that limit we sort of understand. Here, what happens is that this is the swimmer, and the particle is a sort of big thing round here, and basically the swimmer just bounces off it. Okay, the particle I think goes up to 150, so it's it's pretty big uh, around there. That's its centre there. Same here. This is where it comes in further away from the particle. Here it misses the particle <coughs> altogether. And then in the middle it sort of does something which is a bit in between that and that. So there's nothing you can get your hands on in terms of theoretical physics which allows you to to talk about anything generic. We tried this for different sorts of swimmers. We tried it for, um, well, basically just different model swimmers. And, and you get sort of the same thing. But you can't take the data and plot it in a nice way so that everything collapses onto the same curve. It's a nasty problem now because it really isn't generic in any way. It depends enormously on the details of the swimmer and the details of the tracer particle. And so I don't know what the right question to ask is now. What people have been doing is some really nice simulations. These are some simulations on the archive. These big things here are the swimmers. The big white blobs are the swimmers. OK. And these are squirmers. What well, Basically, this is a, a spherical swimmer model. The little ones are the um, tracer particles. And what you can see here is the, the green thing is the velocity field, which is sort of nice you can measure, but it's a bit hard to see anything from there. And they measured 
the diffusion of the tracer particles in the swimmer suspension, and we're back with a picture which looks very similar to the experimental picture. So that works, and that's nice. But, you know, it's, it, what are we understanding? What are we learning in a way? Just that the numerics reproduces what's going on. Yeah? So does the PDS change a lot with different swimmers? I don't think anyone's really looked at that. So basically here you just change the trace of particle size? This one, these are really tracers, so they're essentially zero size. Zero size. Okay. Yeah. In the size before, I'm, I was just trying to see what happened as a function of radius of the particles. And that was a, much, uh, a very different simulation because there we had one particle and the swimmer coming into one particle. Okay, whereas this is a much more fancy simulation because you have lots of swimmers, done by someone else, I might say, of these people, um, lots of swimmers and lots of tracer particles. So here you can look at a distribution of displacements. And then uh, with the, this point buffer like this, uh, means a higher fire concentration. Yes. Um, swimmers, uh, swimmers. This is the concentration of swimmers. So it makes lots of sense that it's going to move further if you have more swimmers in there. Okay. You get these same long tails, <coughs> sort of. I mean, these curves here, I don't think I actually have data points on, but um, get these long tails. So it's more or less the same figure as before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it agrees with the experiments, yeah, which is nice, yeah, yeah. Um, it's certainly going to depend, yes, on where the particle is relative to the swimmers, and it's going to be, they're more likely to be close to a swimmer when there are more swimmers there. And what makes it worse is they're also more likely to interact with more than one swimmer, which makes life very tricky. Yeah. So the loops and the entrainment are sort of generic things which we can understand. We've actually done a bit about... Um, swimmers w where you have a random walk and, and you can say something about that but it's really hard to get much further except numerically <coughs> with these more complicated systems so if anyone's got any ideas anyone got any ideas of nice things to try we could do with some more experiments perhaps um, but I think this problem's now got to the we're stuck unless we do just big simulations. And even then, it's difficult to understand much because we change the swimmers a bit and the answers change. Yeah. What is the increase in the number of the swimmers? This is increasing the number of the swimmers up here. OK, because then the things get pushed. Particles get pushed. The, the choice of particles gets bigger. We couldn't see any patterns in terms of the relative sizes. I mean, it's certainly a good question to ask, but we couldn't see any patterns. No. Yeah. Yeah? To what extent does this behavior of this PDF depend on, on the persistent length of the swimmer? <coughs> um, that's a good question. We did a simple model system, and we found that at least in three dimensions, rather surprisingly, um, the diffusion constant, the estimated diffusion constant, was independent of the persistence length. But that was a sort of special cancellation in 3D, which went away in two and four dimensions. Um, but that was a simple model. It wasn't, I, I'm not sure if anyone's measured it in, in simulations. Yeah. Yeah, someone did experiments once, a long time ago, where they tried to look at this tracer displacement in two dimensions, swimmers in a film. And they found that the diffusion constant was much, much bigger for swimmers in two dimensions than in 3D. And I don't think anyone's explained that properly yet. That's a total. Good, OK. So those are the answers to the questions that we 
that we posed uh, <coughs> then. And there we are. This is where I spend my, this is a day job. Now, I thought it'd be nice to actually hear some of you. So these, I asked for volunteers, and these three people have very kindly volunteered. And certainly, um, particularly, Pepin, have I said that right? I mean, your, yours is related to this, isn't it? Yes. yes. So would you like to come and, and tell us? I feel a bit guilty because I'm getting out of doing this, but I think I'd much rather listen to him for a bit. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, also, earlier you mentioned that we as a field know a lot about flow fields around swimmers. I personally uh, know very little about flow fields around swimmers, and that might become painfully obvious later on. But um, I did do a number of experiments on self-propelled droplets um, and measured, indeed, flow fields around these droplets, and so I do think it matches well um, with what you have told us earlier. I hope, I, it, uh, I hope, I hope it does. It's yeah, so wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, yeah. indeed. Um, so yeah, I hope it will be interesting. Um, but let's first talk about this, this system and why, uh, why studying the flow field around them. So I study oil droplets um, that are slowly dissolving in the surrounding medium of surfactant uh, and water. And this dissolution happens in a kind of a funky way in the sense that they don't dissolve in water, but rather they um, dissolve into oily micelles. So Surfactant comes in from the solution at the surface of these droplets co-assembles to form very stable oily micelles. And what happens is that effectively these droplets uh, create therefore a profile around them of uh, surfactant monomers. <coughs> now we know that the surface tension of droplets depends on uh, the surfactant concentration around them. And so uh, if, you, if you would put an external gradient of surfactant around the droplet, the Marangoni force would, would cause it to move in this gradient. Okay, you might ask, but this droplet is spherical, it's dissolving in a more or less symmetric manner, right? So this will just make a perfectly symmetric concentration gradient of SDS around it, and that will cause it to move. Turns out, however, that there's some sort of uh, funky hydrodynamic instability, and if this droplet moves a little bit, there is advection going from the front to the back of the particle that disturbs this concentration, this symmetric concentration profile, makes an asymm uh, asymmetric SDS gradient, and these droplets swim in that gradient. They move from low to high SDS concentration. Right. And what that looks like is this. Um, so these are just simple oil droplets slowly dissolving and as a consequence swimming in the, in the surrounding medium. And if you do this for a 30 micrometer droplet, which I would consider small but is still fairly large um, compared to what we've been talking uh, to before, these droplets will simply move in a straight line. But what we saw is that if you increase the size of these droplets, they will start to turn around. The, the scale bars that you see are 100 micron. So the, the, the biggest drop is 120 micron. And they do a lot of turning, a lot of circling, and a sort of oscillating motion. And I really don't understand what's going on. But this did uh, motivate us to look at the flow around these droplets. Oh, and this is another uh, example that I wanted to give. If you have uh, two of these 100 micrometer droplets, and they meet each other, uh, the weirdest thing happens, and, and again, something with the in an instability in hydrodynamic flow happens, and they can go into a very wow. stable rotation around each other. Also, do not understand what is going on here, but this motivated us to look at the flow around these droplets, because clearly everything these droplets do is completely due to the, the liquid they manage to flow around them. Right, and so I did basically what you, what you have described before, Julia. Um, and put tracer particles in uh, around these droplets. So the first time, I'm not sure you can read, the first movie was in uh, real time, and now it's four times slow down. Uh, and we see that these tracer particles move, and so this will tell us something about the flow field. We also did this, can we, yes, okay. Also did this for bigger particles that do the oscillating motion. This is again real speed, so real time. So this is very fast motion, right? This is very fast uh, swimming droplets. And put tracer particles around them and try that to visualize what the flow around these swimming droplets uh, look like. Right, and, and this is a bit difficult to analyze, right? So you can do particle image full symmetry using a, a plug-in in MATLAB, really, um, and just track how these, uh, how these particles, uh, the tracer particles, are moving, 
and get some idea of the flow around these droplets. This is again a small one, about 30 micrometers, and um, now this is not really Brownian motion that makes this so noisy, but just the fact that the, the fluid around it is a bit uh, yeah, not so quies acquiescent, so there's some fluctuations, and we can't really see say much about the flow around it. But if we take an average of this movie, this is the flow profile um, that you end up with. So we see that it pulls in liquid from the back, pushes it out on the, on the front, and there's these two sort of vortices around it. I would call this a dipole, um, or had called it a dipole before, but that, that might be wrong. Um, and this is what the, the swimming for the small droplet looks like, that goes more or less in a straight line. Right? But we saw that if you have bigger droplets, they do this turning and, and uh, rotating. So what does the, uh, the flow around such a droplet look like? Right, the good thing is that the flow around such a droplet is much stronger, and so you don't need to average as much. You can just look um, at the flow instantaneously. And what we see is that, well, again, I might use the wrong terminology, but I, I think, uh, sometimes see something that I would consider a dipole, where the flow, uh, the liquid's coming in from the back and going out on the front, and sometimes I see something that I would call a quadrupole, where there is two streams of flow coming in and two streams of flow um, coming out. I have snapshots of that, so this I would consider a dipole. This, I would say, is a, is a quadrupole. And then there's also a bunch of frames that are kind of weird, and that are sort of a combination of both, I guess. Okay, so what happens if you average this? Dipole again. That kind of makes sense, because the way you average these droplets, they move. So you need to translate each frame, and moreover, they turn. And so you, need to also need to, uh, you also need to rotate each frame such that the droplets always move in the same direction and always lie on top of each other. Um, and if you translate and rotate, you only add up the flows that correlate to the direction of motion, which is this flow, this correlates strongly with um, the swimming. The quadrupole, or um, this other type of flow field, does not have a correlation with the direction of motion. And so if you just rotate your frames, you average out um, all of these quadrupole or moving flows. Okay, now, the stuff that I've told you so far are sort of 2D projections of what really must be three-dimensional flow. These droplets are large, they're sitting close to a, a glass surface, and so the, what happens in the third dimension might matter. However, this is going way too fast to say anything um, about, let me skip that, about the, the, yeah, the three dimensions, so you can't really do confocal uh, with this. But what we can do is look from the side. So that's what we see here on the, on the top left image. This is sort of a sessile droplet sitting on a, a glass surface, and we're looking with the microscope from the side, and what we see is that flow is coming in from the top um, and, and coming out on the side. And this must have to do, I guess, with the, the gravity also. Um, and these droplets are still trying to use up surfactant to slowly dissolve. This is driving on the spool. You can do the same with a, a droplet that is not sessile but still sitting on the glass surface and you see a similar flow. And if you average these, you get these donut-shaped profiles, right? Flow coming in from the side, going out uh, from the top, going out on the sides and turning back on themselves. And this was the hardest experiment in which I tried to do this for a droplet that is like the previous droplet swimming around um, and try to also look at the flow of such a swimming droplet perpendicular to or like perpendicular swimming direction, so uh, in Z. And the first thing that you might notice is that it's sitting it's quite high away from the from the glass surface, like maybe 100, 150 micrometers. And it, this must show a sort of combination of the flows that I showed you before in x, y, and it has this, uh, this flow in the z direction. Um, now, as I said before, I have very little understanding of these flow profiles, but I hope that you uh, have, a, have a little more of an idea of what's going on. Because these are uh, all the data I wanted to show you. Thank you. That's great. Anyone got any questions? Yeah, I was wondering these pictures of the flow profiles you showed, yeah. they were in the left frame, weren't they? Not in the rest frame? Or, or no, they, they are in the rest frame. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I translate every time such that the droplet sits in the origin, and then rotate such that the direction in which the droplet swims is always the same. So, they're in the rest frame of the droplet. Ah, yeah. okay. And also rotated such that it moves in the same direction. Because there were a few ones that you called dipoles. Yes. But they, to me, they looked a bit like the stokeslets. Yeah. Next to it. Mm -hmm. Can we have uh, 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 which as if there would be a net force? Um, this one you mean? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. This is <laughs> this is what it looks like if you average it. This is in the <coughs> go-moving frame. But I guess this is uh, not the far field, right? This is close to the droplets. Right? Okay. Yeah. Less than one diameter away. Yes. So I agree. All the all together, the, the flow must be. Yeah. Yes. Have, have you thought about fitting it with a rotlet? Because usually, when you've got something going round, mm -hmm. both the rotlet term and then there's this source dipole thing. Right. Because which happens if you've got a finite size. Yes, I, I have not. Yeah. Uh, because I just learned today about rotlets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get it worse than was the packet. That means it's mostly related on the problem. Sorry, can you? Yes. Oh, it's in the outside liquid. So the droplet is just oil, DET, uh, DEP, DET of the lake, and the outside liquid is, is SDS, um, sodium dodecyl surfactant. But it's it's flowing to the droplet and then sort of. Yeah. How, how do you get your, how can you get your stress? Right, so, well, the SDS is consumed sort of at the source <coughs> of the droplet to form these very stable, oily micelles. So co-assemblies of the oil inside the droplet and the surfactant outside. Yeah. But, but Which means that there is a, a gradient of surfactant yeah. on the droplet surface. How can you get this gradient? Because the, some, the SDS monomer concentration is not the same everywhere around the droplet. Because on, some, on one side it's more consumed into forming these oily micelles than on the other side. Does that answer your question? It's a bit of a tricky microscopic picture. Mm -hmm. Which is again a function of sort of the randomness of I don't know how it interacts, how the oil interacts with the SDS. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just about the gas. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we perhaps better move on, but he'll be here at the coffee break. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are absolutely wonderful about giving talks. When I was your age, I, you know, I'd be petrified. And you're great. You're wonderful. Um, okay, Eric, so you, and then when you've done yours, it's probably time for the tea uh, break, right. I think, yes. So okay. don't, yeah, so I'm yeah. Not, not trying to get them to rush you. <laughs> thank right. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, also a little bit of a uh, disclaimer I also just started. I don't have a lot of results yet. I just thought it would be nice to uh, well uh, sort of talk about it and uh, yeah, ask us a question for you, see so what you can uh, come up with. Um, a process on the uh, multi scale understanding and control of spray drying, um, purpose of, uh, of drying. Um, and uh, I'm from the product and process engineering group at the TU Delft. So uh, I don't think all of you have heard about spray drying, so I thought let's first introduce it a little bit. Uh, spray drying is a, a drying technique uh, where you take a liquid feed, you put it through a nozzle, you create a very high surface area, a lots, lots of small, tiny droplets. Uh, you introduce a hot air stream, and you dry it very fast into a, into a powder. Uh, ideally, you want some kind of uh, aggregation in there. You want um, you want aggregates. Uh, if they're too small, uh, they come out at the at the bottom, put them back into the top, um, and then they can impact each other again, and, and uh, then they form bigger aggregates. Um, now, these small dried particles are called fines in the in the industry. So we have the hot air, we have the liquid spray, the, the yeah, so the, the liquid spray coming in, and we have the fines, and it's all interacting with each other and impacting. Uh, and then out comes the aggregated product. Now, this is a bit of an, an unknown area, and uh, so when we are when the, our industrial partners are designing the spray dryers, they, um, yeah, they say, well, we don't really know, and when we're designing it, we're relying on sort of empirical data and or the, the sort of the, uh, the experts that we have. We don't really understand what's, ha what's happening. So when we look there, we see that, of course, we have evaporation of the, uh, of the liquid droplets, and they become, become smaller, and then um, somehow they become more concentrated, so they become sticky. Uh, and then if they dry further, they just are just dry, uh, dry particles. Uh, and we see all kinds of, uh, like I talked about the aggregation, so we'll see all kinds of impacts that are happening. Uh, we have, for example, the, the drying droplets that interact with the dry particles. We have um, two, two uh, drying droplets interacting uh, or impacting each other. They impact the wall, which is something we don't want. So we get fouling of the spray dryer wall, and then you have to clean it again, which is a horrible mess. Um, and also the, the droplets interacting with the agglomerates. Um, the main thing here is the stickiness of this particle. Uh, somehow, these, as these droplets dry, uh, they become sticky, uh, which uh, it seems like it has to do with some kind of uh, skin formation. 
Um, and for that, I will go to the next one. So here, the, the dark green will be a higher viscosity, and then the, the lighter green is a, a light viscosity. And we start all the way on the left side with the, the first droplet that we, uh, that we make. Um, so what, uh, what we have in this droplet is just a, a droplet, and there are some uh, solid particles in there. Um, usually, you see something like uh, proteins or sugars. But also, uh, often they dry, uh, something like probiotics. So we have bacteria in there, <coughs> and we see if we dry, we see the viscosity becoming higher uh, on the surface of the droplet. Um, and as we dry further, sort of the surface at one point locks in place. It doesn't really shrink anymore. And uh, this is called sort of the locking, locking point, uh, is what it's called. Uh, but mostly we see the skin formation. And this has to do with the, the solute in the droplet sort of uh, collecting, um, yeah, collecting at the surface of the droplet. And, oh, I see something really wrong there. Either way, this has to do with uh, uh, the Peclet number. Uh, this is the uh, sort of the, the advective transport uh, over the diffusive transport. And to say it quite simply, if you have a, a droplet that is shrinking, you have movement of the of the surface, and also the, the particles that are inside it are diffusing because of a concentration gradient. And usually in the spray dryers, it goes so fast that the movement of the boundary going inside is faster than the particles that can actually diffuse, uh, diffuse inside. So they uh, sort of uh, collect uh, all together at the, at the outside, creating a skin. Um, you can get some fun things. Uh, for example, if you have a, a sugar maltodextrin in there, uh, you get a skin uh, on the outside. Uh, that's not very strong and it kind of buckles in as it dries further. But you can also get very st uh, strong skins. For example, whey protein isolate does this. You, um, you get a skin that is so strong that, uh, like I told about uh, this locking point, the, the droplet can't really shrink anymore. But because the skin is so strong, the only way it can evaporate <coughs> further is to create a hole in the skin and you get sort of a vacuole that forms from the outside in and it drives from the inside out and you just get a shell at the end. So the two big questions that we have uh, that we're looking into is um, if we're looking at the impact of the droplets, uh, what makes them sticky? So uh, like how do the, the drying kinetics in the dryer, how do they affect the, the surface? And then uh, they also impact each other. So how do the, the surface properties affect the, the impact behavior? So what we are, are doing for this, we can look into a spray dryer, but there's, uh, a, there's so many droplets, there's a lot of stuff going on. So ideally, we just want to look at single droplets. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, as, uh, yeah, a commercial uh, dispenser. We will use and we will shoot droplets to a channel with an airflow and then uh, as they dry, uh, we can point this to, uh, we can have two of them put them next to each other and then impact droplets and see what's, see what's happening. But ideally we want to go a little bit smaller because with this one we can only go down to about 140 micrometer droplets. Uh, for that we will use uh, microfluidics. And uh, with this one we hope to get down to at least 50 micrometers uh, of droplets. These are also more the industrially relevant uh, droplets. Uh, so what we will have is probably a, uh, a liquid droplet uh, that we will bring in a, in a continuous uh, air phase and then uh, see how it dries. So once we have this dispensing taken care of, we will uh, let them impact each other, record it with a high-speed camera, and we're mostly interested in the, impact of the, the influence of the, the impact angle, impact velocity, and again, the surface properties, so if we have particles and the impact, do they stick, do they bounce off each other? What's gonna happen there? So, you might wonder well, what does this has to do with active matter and uh, stuff like that. I was talking about the, uh, that not, sometimes we have the probiotics in there. And uh, for us, it's not really the, the focus that we are, uh, or it's not really in our, um, in what we're in my project. But uh, I was really curious about uh, also your, your opinion on this, that if we have these uh, bacteria in there and they do move around, how do they relate to the, to the already the flows that we have in the droplet as it dries and it goes from a, a not so viscous droplet, basically viscosity of water, and it becomes slowly more viscous uh, starting at the outside and then becoming more viscous overall and then going to a dry particle. 
how did he, uh, how does the the movement of the bacteria and the droplet how does it relate to the also the Marangoni flow we see the Brownian uh, that's that's mostly my question here what you think about that um, so I think that's uh, my presentation People have comments? Questions? I think. Yeah. Particle vitability is a, like, is a neutral one thing. Do you see a particle is attached at the, at the surface of the droplet? So the particle? The particle vitability. Like the particle prefer to stay inside the droplet or prefer to stay at the surface of the droplet? Um, so they, they usually stay in the droplet because it's uh, so it's uh, the, the outside fit is, is air. Mm -hmm. So usually what you see is they sort of all uh, all collect at the surface, mm -hmm. and um, because they, yeah, they they usually have a hard time getting out of the, the water phase. Yeah. They change the chemical properties of the droplet when they coll collect at yeah. the skin. Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking into. Okay. So depending on uh, yeah. yeah, so the usually what you get um, if you would have uh, slow drying. Yeah. You just get that your bulk concentration <coughs> increases. Right. Uh, but we see because we have so fast drying that it all collects at the outside. And then you get sort of a, a gel layer sometimes. Okay. Depending on what you have. You can also get sort of a network yeah. of, uh, of proteins. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What was the time scale there? How long you how long is it before they dry? Well that depends. I think the smallest they have in, in industry they dry. 20 milliseconds. Gosh. And then the, the biggest one, maybe on a 50 micrometer, that's <coughs> two seconds. So you wonder if these little swimmers, you know, if they're going to mix it up, did they have time to mix it they up? They have time to mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Two things. Mm, maybe. maybe. Good. Well, thank you very much. I think we're, we're going to have coffee now. So if we get back about, about five past nine, yeah? And then we've got one more talk from you lot, and then um, what I'll talk about after the break is. These little chaps, let's see if I can see. Yeah, do, do, do more. I'll just put this up for a little bit later. Okay, great. Thank you for coming back. One's never quite sure. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, this is, oh, keeps finishing, but this is what we're going to do next. We're going to worry about what happens if um, swimmers move through a dense, polymeric suspension, because a lot of them do. And in particular, what do you expect? Well, you expect them to go slower, right, if, they, if they're going through lots of polymers. And it seems that they don't. They go quicker. And we wanted to try and understand why. So rather than background now, this is research. And this is a slightly slow, slower version, so I should put, of, of a research seminar. So when we get to it, <laughs> first thing I want to do is say thank you very much to the person who's done all the hard work and explained it to me, who is Andreas Sottle, who's a postdoc at Oxford, just moving to Paris, and also the other people listed there who've also um, contributed. So... When do we get microswimmers swimming through polymeric meshes? And the answer is in lots of different places. And these are some examples. First of all, in your body, between the various organs is the extracellular matrix. And what the extracellular matrix is, is lots of polymers which are basically form a really rather dense gel. So it's not quite the same as polymers because these are s the extracellular matrix is much more stuck together into a gel. But it's certainly that these swimmers have to get through um, little holes. In your stomach, in your lungs, everywhere like that, on top, the, the, the lining of a stomach is a layer of cells. It's called the epithelial layer. And on top of that is a layer of mucus. And the properties of this mucus is important because it determines how um, the products of digestion can get across the mucus and get to the stomach walls. And there are all sorts of rather nasty diseases which happen if that layer of mucus breaks down. You get rather nasty stomach ulcers and inflammations. 
And it's surprising how little anybody knows about these layers of mucus. Um, it doesn't seem, I mean, they've, they've tried to understand when it's easy for particles to get across and when it isn't easy for particles to get across, when it's easy for short-chain polymers to get across and when it isn't easy. And sort of the biggest ones find it a bit harder, but that certainly isn't the whole story. And maybe chemical interactions are important. Maybe the, uh, the local pH and the wetting properties of the various things are important. But it, 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 it's a very important problem, and nobody understands anything to a very good approximation. The other place you get bacteria moving in um, dense, dense mass of polymers is in biofilms, biofilm formation. At the beginning of biofilm formation, the bacteria stick on the surface, and then they produce polymers, and those polymers help to stick them together. And so in the early stages of biofilm formation, they're still moving, and they're moving through these arrays of polymers. One of the um, nastiest diseases because of this is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is um, what happens when you can't clear the mucus away from your lungs properly. So on the surface of lungs are these cilia that we saw before, which are trying to push fluid across the lungs, and in particular to push a layer of mucus, and the mucus gets pushed out and carries the dust particles with it. And cystic fibrosis is when that goes wrong and the mucus becomes too sticky, so it becomes impossible to push it out of the lungs. So understanding all this thing about how um, fluids move in the body and how bacteria contribute to that movement is actually very important. And at the moment, people just don't understand um, what's going on. So a very first theoretical physics sort of step. OK, really quite a long way away from the real problems, but maybe understanding the basics will be able to understand the more complicated systems. What you'd expect is if you add polymers to a suspension, the viscosity goes up. That's that mu thing on the bottom of that equation. And so the swimming speed goes down. It's harder for these things to swim through polymers. What probably actually happens, I'll show you the experiments, and you can make up your own mind, is that when you add polymers, the viscosity goes up and the swimming speed goes up. So why do I say that? What evidence is there? Well, these are the experiments. I've just put the words, because I can never remember which, what, exactly what's doing what. The one on the top left is um, C. elegans. And what are we plotting there? The velocity as a function of the viscosity. So going along here, you're adding more molecules of xanthan gum. So it's getting a denser and denser polymer solution. And you can see that the swimming speed sort of goes down and then jumps to a higher value, really quite a jump. And this jump is about where you get um, cross-linging start, starting to occur when the polymers start overlapping significantly with each other. These are the Edinburgh experiments. If you talk to um, Wilson Poon, he says that that's wrong because they've got too many impurities in there. He says that really there isn't very much of a speed up at all and that all this stuff about a speed up is wrong and what you get is it's more or less flat till here, and by then you've really got a very, very dense suspension, and then the velocity goes down. Then there's this one. This one is um, man-made swimmers, just little magnetic helices which swim in a rotating magnetic field. And what the different curves are are suspensions which are shear thinning to a different degree, and if you make them... Um, more shear thinning, you go from red to blue to green to pink, red to blue to green to pink, so it's not even monotonic. Okay, 
the early experiments say that there's a speed up, that these things speed up when you put in polymers. And the early experiments didn't worry about anything. They just sort of got some nice graphs <laughs> and things speeded up. So the experimental situation is not entirely clear. The theoretical sim situation is also not entirely clear. But what all these papers agree on is that when you put in polymers, the velocity speeds up. The things swim faster in a polymer suspension. So they all have different explanations for this, but they all work that you get a speed up. And these all sort of make, uh, all make sense. Um, some of the early work said, right, I've got a network of polymers, so basically the swimmers use them to help push on. Essentially, the, the flow field is screened by the polymers. And so you use less energy creating flows a long way away, and so you've got more energy to keep going. If you, it's known, we all know, that if, if you put something in a tube, a swimmer in a tube, it will swim faster because it can sort of push off the walls of the tube. Whoops. There we are. Um, and this, you can either think of this as a network or you could think of the polymers as being essentially static obstacles. Those are about the same. Um, again, a Poon idea was locally you get shear thinning. Locally, you get a lot of shear from the tail of the bacterium and that stretches out the polymers. And if the polymers are stretched, they have effectively lower viscosity. And so the thing can move more easily. There's this thing about polymer depletion. This is a nice one. Um, around a bacterium, you can't get so many polymers just from the depletion effect. It's harder for them to get close to the surface. And so the bacterium sees a layer with not many polymers before you start on the polymer suspension. So lots of different possibilities. Also, there's a speed up. It's really hard to tell which one's right because, as we saw, doing the experiments is really, really difficult. And so we don't even have one set of experiments you can really believe. The other thing which would be annoying, of course, is that the little swimmer says, oh, no, I'm in this horrible gungy polymer solution. I'm not going to bother anymore and goes, Bleh. or decides that it really likes being here and starts swimming really fast. And, and just there's a biological reason why it swims faster in this sort of suspension. So I'm making the assumption that the swimming stroke doesn't change. And of course, that's an assumption. Uh, it might change. So we thought we perhaps should do simulations. Um, and luckily, I had Andreas, who is incredibly good at simulations. And this is the sort of simulations you can do. A little model swimmer, which is moving here in a bath of rather short polymers and a not very dense bath of rather short polymers. And if you want to lose all your friends who are trying to use the same computer, you can also do simulations like this, where the polymers are much longer and where they're much more dense. At the moment, they're not cross-linked. That's something which sort of comes next. At the moment, we don't want them to be cross-linked. So, so they actually are joined to each other. Thank you. Good, good point. So, they actually, so it's more a network. These can slide over each other. So first of all, let me tell you what the model is, how we do the simulations. We need to simulate, first of all, the fluid, the, the water in inverted commas. It's, more high, it's not real water. It's hydrodynamic interactions essentially. And then we have to worry about how to do the swimmer. And then we have to worry about how to do the polymers. Now, the way we do the water is what's called multiparticle collision dynamics. Who's heard of multiparticle collision dynamics? Some of you, but, but not so many. W what this is, is a way of putting in the hydrodynamic interactions. It works in a similar way to, say, Lattice-Boltzmann. Um, but this is a slightly different 
stories. So there are no real water molecules. There's just effective interactions. And the reason codes like this one work is that if you remember back to when you were first taught Navier-Stokes equations, you learnt that it was due to conservation of momentum. Really, all you have to put in is conservation of momentum, and then Navier-Stokes comes out the other end. Right? You know the continuity equation is conservation of mass. If you put in conservation of momentum as well, you get, end up with Navier-Stokes, almost. And so the way the algorithm works is that you have a set of particles, just pretend particles, and there are two steps. First of all, they stream. That means just that they all have some velocity, and they move with that velocity for a time step. And then there's a collision. And what the collision does is that it changes momentum between the particles. It exchanges momentum. But at the same time, it conserves momentum. So it's a pretend collision. And the, the, the pretend collision, as long as it conserves momentum, when you look at the continuum equations describing this, when you write down the equations on a sort of coarse-grained level, so in terms of the average velocity and the average density of the particles, Navier-Stokes will come out. So I, th I always thought that's really cute, okay? Because you can define all sorts of different collision rules uh, which will work. The one we actually use here is a thing called the Anderson thermostat. And what you do is you basically divide your system into boxes, cubic boxes, and then you do the collision within each box. And within each box, you just choose new velocities from a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, but you choose them in such a way that you conserve momentum and conserve energy. Sorry, don't conserve energy, conserve momentum. And because you choose them from Maxwell-Boltzmann, you automatically thermostat the system at a given temperature t. <coughs> So it's a really simple algorithm. Stream, take a little box, collide everything in that box to mix up the momentum, mix it up so that momentum's conserved, and then they stream off again. And that carries momentum around the system in exactly the same way as the Navier-Stokes equations would, as long as you don't look too closely on a too small level. OK, so that's the water in inverted commas, that's the hydrodynamics. This is the swimmer. The swimmer is well, what you'd expect, really. It's a body. And then a series of beads, which are constrained by interactions to be in a helical shape. And the helix is slightly flexible. And then you have to worry a little bit about how to, um, to fit it onto the body so that it can turn around. And then the way we drive it is by equal and, opposed, or equal and opposite torques on the head and the tail. Remember, I have to have something which is torque free. So I need a, uh, an equal and opposite torque on two bits. So the head goes around like that and the tail goes around like that. And we fix um, the torques. Then you have to worry about coupling this thing to the water, to the fluid algorithm. We just put the normal no-slip boundary conditions on the surface of the head. And then on the tail, we include the beads in the collision step. Because these are just beads, just particles, very like the particles I had before. And so you have a load of tail here, and we just include those beads in the collision step. And that allows momentum to be transferred from the tail to the, to the swimmer. And there he goes. OK. And then the polymers are dead standard. How you'd always do polymers, just as a bead spring model. And beads 
are joined together, and we just put interactions along the springs so we can make them stiffer or flexible, depending on what we want to do. Okay, does this sort of vague, basic model make sense? Any questions? Person's right. Okay. So these are the different polymers we looked at. First of all, we looked at just monomers, just beads. And then we looked at polymers which were flexible and had length 4. And then we had ones which had length 12 uh, and were flexible, semi-flexible, and then these are more like rods. Okay. And the, yeah. Mm. I think so. Um, I'm going to end up with an effective slip, but I think we have to put in a slip just because that is what you measure on almost everything, almost every real surface. Even on superhydrophobic surfaces, which are meant to be slippy, the slip length is nanometers. Yeah. So yes, I think it is justified. OK, so these are color-coded, and they will continue to be color-coded, but I think it will be obvious which one's which, because everything always happens in this order. OK, so these are just pictures of what it looks like. We change the density of these different sorts of polymers, and so these are these n equals 12 semi-flexible ones, and we do simulations with different densities, and these are the numbers. Okay, these are big simulations. Watch the things get dense. Um, we, we ran them in house on our local machine, which is about 200 um, processor cluster. It's sort of hard. It wasn't helpful to put them on a big nation, national machine because this is a code which is hard to parallelize efficiently. Um, and the big ones took a long time. And I actually dislike doing things this long. I think one should try to be clever, but I wasn't able to be clever to, to, to make it much less than that. And this is what they look like. You know, this is the real size and how many polymers are in there. Um, and that shows you that I think we're not going to get terrible boundary effects in these sorts of uh, things. Hello. That's right. It may well, but things are different with a different sort of swimmer. We tried to make it look a bit like Vibrio, I think it is, which is a real bacterium. Um, and it's slightly easier to code one with a single helical tail than lots of things. But um, you have to start somewhere. I mean, I think it's more that than anything else. We sort of wanted to know exactly what we were doing and then get this straight, and then we can move on to other things. Yeah, but it may well be different for different swimmers. OK, so now the results. OK, so this is 1 over the viscosity. Note it's inverse viscosity. Eta 0 is the viscosity with, with no polymers in there as a function of density. And it does what we expect. If we remember, this is inverse viscosity. The viscosity is going up, and the inverse viscosity is going down. And the longer or the stiffer the polymers, the more it does it. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah? How, how do you measure the viscosity? Uh, we measure the viscosity <coughs> by um, essentially putting on a flow field which looked like that by putting a shear there and a shear there, and then seeing what the profile looked like. OK, then this is the angular velocity. It's constant torque, so the angular velocity can change. And this is pretty much what you'd expect, right? The angular velocity goes down as you increase the density. And it goes down more for, a dent for, 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 for longer polymers and stiffer, um, and stiffer polymers. 
right, fine, everything's boring so far, until you get to this. This is the velocity versus the polymer density, so the velocity of the swimmer, and certainly if any would, one would guess that that would get slower as well, that's where we started, and it doesn't. It goes up, and it goes up really quite a lot. Okay, so for these ones here, we're talking about an increase of about 60% over the fluid, which has no polymers in at all. Now, the advantage of doing these simulations is that now we're in a position to answer the question, why? Because the nice things about simulations is you can measure what you want to measure. So, uh, sorry. yeah? Again, yeah. Uh, my slide before. Sorry, so it's uh, in. So the square, the, the blue square uh, markers, uh, so it's uh, half of the box of surface. Yeah, these are, these are the ones where it's, where it's not very flexible at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you can see that something strange is happening so here. Also um, it, yeah, it makes a difference, but not an enormous difference. And I don't think we really understand this data point, why that one isn't. Um, I mean, it sort of makes sense that things are going to go a bit wrong when you start having rods. Um, but that's not a good explanation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually not going to talk very much about flexibility, but mostly about uh, length is the thing which really makes it obvious. Yeah. All right. So we're happy that that's an increase. Yeah. So let's look at the velocity field, because that would be the first sensible thing to look at. Can we understand from the velocity field what's going on? Can we, from the velocity field, look at those different theories which predicted a speed up and see which one's right? Well, this is the velocity field in the ZR plane, where Z is the direction the swimmer swims. Look, it's pretending to be the Loch Ness monster here, but you can see the directions from this. There's its head and there's its tail. This is R, right, and theta is the angle around it. This is the flow field um, without polymers. That's the flow field with polymers. It's a very nice dipole, which you expect, and there really isn't much difference. Right, so that's boring. So then we looked at the flow field around the swimmer, so that's looking tail on. And so you can see it's pushing the fluid round. This is one of those nice rotlets. Here, it doesn't have polymers, and there it does have polymers. And you can see there really is, you know, it's sort of looking, looking like there's a difference there. So now let's plot the flow field going away from the swimmer along here. The magnitude of this azimuthal flow, the magnitude of the flow around the swimmer going away from the swimmer. OK, and this is what it looks like. It looks like that. And if we increase the density of the polymers, it starts looking like this. OK, now you expect that flow field to be 1 over r squared. It's expected to be a, um, a rotlet, 1 over r squared. And so this line here is 1 over r squared. So this is a long way from the swimmer. You see the fall off, which is 1 over r squared. And that's the same for all of them. They both go down as 1 over r squared. OK, so this is less, but it's still got the same slope. And what's that saying is that you don't get any screening, that the flow field goes on forever, even if the polymers are there. It's not like it's being caged in some sort of tube. <coughs> no screening, because if it was screening, this thing would go down exponentially. So these ideas that the polymers are acting as a sort of um, cage don't work, at least in this particular setup. But the flow field is decreased from its value without the polymers. And what you can do is you can, I mean, you can sort of see it here. This is dividing it 
by its value without the polymer. So here's the value without the polymers, and here we're dividing it by that value. And you can see the flow field is going down with increasing density. And here you get it going back up to its value without polymers. So it's maybe a bit hard to get that from the pictures, but what's happening is that nearby the swimmer, there's a region where the polymers can't get to, where it looks pretty much like pure water, and then a bit further away, it goes over to polymers. Now, of course, it's not just two regions with a complete boundary between them, but if you do a theory which says, I've got just water near to the polymers, and then further away, I have the normal polymer solution, everything matches really quite nicely. And that makes sense because very close to the swimmer, it's sort of much harder for the polymers to get there because they have a finite size, and so they can't so easily be in the region very close to the swimmer, and it turns out particularly very close to the tail. And the bigger ones, that's going to be a bigger effect because they're bigger, so they find it much more difficult to be close to the swimmer. Essentially, they can't be within a radius of gyration of the surface because they just won't fit. So the data in the simulations matches very nicely thinking of this as having this depletion layer. And it turns out that the depletion layer turns out to be the same thing as an effective slip on the surface. Makes sense, but it's not obvious. But if you do the maths, that's what comes out. And the effective slip you can calculate looks like this. And those are our data points. So what's happening? Yes, yes, go on. Yes, we did think that. We thought quite hard about that. Um, but there's no evidence, and, and we tried to measure it. It's not easy to measure, but we tried to measure the relaxation time of the polymers. And it is very fast compared with the time scales here. So in this particular case, um, the shear caused by the um, thing going round just isn't enough to stretch them enough for that to be a problem. Yeah. But it's certainly, you know, it's one of the theories and, and it's something we look for very hard. Yeah. 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 Then why does the velocity increase? Why is it faster than if it would only be water? It, it, it's, it's because, well, for a start, you have to worry about the fact that you have two different regions. So it's not just that it sees water and therefore it's the same as it sees water forever. Um, because there's still some flow in the polymer bit. So you have to solve it so that you've got um, a velocity field in the bit without polymers falling off in the bit with polymers. And then you just have to do it. I mean, really all I've said so far is that there's this slip velocity. And the fact that there's a slip velocity means it can actually turn more easily, which is why it can swim more easily. Um, but perhaps we need to actually look at the equations to make sure that makes it go faster. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes, in the very dense cases. Um, um, I, I mean, I'm not sure it makes any difference, really. I think it, it's almost saying the same thing in two different ways. It's a good point, but I don't think it, it's clever enough to be able to say, oh, look, there's a big gap over there. Let's move there. <laughs> yeah. Good. I appreciate these questions because I mean I'm still we're still thinking through this, all right. Um, we still have to convince the referees, <laughs> so it's nice to learn what the questions are. Yeah. Mm. Okay, s but we can do the maths now. We've decided that it's an effective slip, and indeed, one of the papers, theorist papers I, I showed, has has used this. One of Eric Lager's papers. 
has used this as, a, as an explanation. So we, we certainly weren't the first to think about it. Um, so let's do the theory, because it's actually quite easy. Let me see if I can explain it, even, even at 20 to 10 at night. Stokes equations are linear. That means that velocities and forces are proportional to each other. In particular, here's the velocity, here's the angular velocity, and they're proportional to the force and the torque. And these numbers here are constants of proportionality, which are called mobilities, and which you need some sort of model to calculate. But you can calculate them for a helix. So they're known, and I'm not going to bother about that. Mm -hmm. right? You could just basically just do it by saying you have a helix is just like lots of little. Um, you integrate along the length of the helix and worry about the drag on the fluid. OK, so this bit here is just Stokes equations are linear. Then we have to put in this slip. Well, what does slip do? It effectively decreases the velocity, and it decreases it by this amount. I've put it with a plus sign on that side, but it might as well be a negative sign on that side. And the amount is r omega, which is the velocity of the helix, yep, times this, which is a dimension, the slip velocity, so that tells you the fraction of r omega with which it's decreased, and then that tan alpha is just helix geometry. Alpha is the pitch angle of the helix. And it's not obvious why it's tan, but it's pretty obvious that something has to come in there. Here's similarly, here's the slip velocity, and it's a dimension of the slip velocity. So this is the fraction with which omega is reduced. Omega goes to 1 minus us because there's a slip velocity. OK? So it's, it's easy to put in the slip velocity. You just change the velocity and angular velocity it's moving with. And then you've done it. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah? Again, last sentence, uh, why the omega also is the slip velocity there? We've decided, because we saw it in the simulations, that there's a slip velocity. Okay. Yeah. So I need to put it in. And I'm doing it in terms of a dimensionless number, which tells me the fraction of the velocity compared to the velocity without slip. Yeah? So r omega is the velocity of this helix. V is r omega. Yep. And then that's re and this is how much the velocity v is reduced due to this slip. OK? OK. Right. So now what I'm going to do is ever so easy. For a start, for our particular problem, we didn't put forces. We just put torques. So I'm just going to put that to 0. OK? And then I can solve from omega from this equation here. And I can put it back into there. And then I can um, work out the velocity. And I'm also going to write down the velocity relative to the velocity if I have no polymers, v over v0. And I'll do that for you. And this is what comes out. Velocity that the helix is moving, that the swimmer is moving, divided by the velocity it would be moving if there were no polymers. And I've got two terms in there. This one here is sort of what we would expect, that it's proportional to 1 over the viscosity. So if I just had that term, then it would slow down if the polymers were there. But then I've got this term, which depends on this slip thing. Yeah? And it comes out like this. I mean, that's how it comes out. OK? And you can plot it. And what happens is this slows it down, but the slip, sorry, oops, wrong way. The slip means that it speeds up. So what I've plotted here is this is this ratio of viscosities, and this is essentially the slip length. The slip length is big. You're in the green bit, and the green bit means that the slip works and it speeds up. But over here, where there's not much slip, it does what you expect, and it slows down. And just by rather lucky chance, our simulations are about here. And so it's speeded up. And it, yeah, and so it's speeded up. So, 
this is now a fit of the theory to the data. So this is the theory, no adjustable parameters. And you can see that the data, well, it's not exactly right, but then you wouldn't expect it to be. It's far too complicated and it's a simple theory. But if you don't put in this slip velocity, that's what the theory says. And that definitely doesn't agree with the data. Yeah? Question. <coughs> Was the formula inferred from the simulation? No. Okay. No. The formula comes from the Stokes equation. Okay. The only thing we said from the simulation is that we have a slip velocity. So the slip velocity term comes from the simulation itself? Not, the, not numerically. Okay. Not numerically. It's just we know it's there, so we work out what it should yeah. be, and then we put it in. So there's no parameters right. adjustable at all there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's hard, especially this time of night. And what's wrong with it? So those are my questions, all right? And you're allowed to have some of your own. First of all, it'd be really nice to have experiments where you can actually test this, because the experiments at the moment are, are very difficult. And it would be nice to have it, I think, with fabricated swimmers, not real ones, so that they can't decide to sort of go belly up on you and decide they don't like the taste of the polymers or something and slow down. We've been talking about a depletion interaction near a surface, not even an interaction, a depletion layer near a surface. But you know, our, our models of polymers are bead spring models. And it's what everybody uses, and they work really well. But in reality, a polymer doesn't have 10 beads joined by chains. It has, you know, a, a, a thousand, um, I don't know, something, something strange and chemical, all right, <laughs> joined by real bonds. And so what's going to happen is that this is, if you like, a, a blob model of a polymer where you get locally blobs which are joined together. And it may be that we're seeing things which are an artifact of those models. So we do have to worry about that. I mean, everyone uses blob models of polymers. Always seems to work. But again, it'd be, one's not sure. This lady asked me about viscoelastic effects. And that's right. It doesn't look like in this particular system viscoelastic effects are important. But for longer polymers, you might well expect them to be ones where the stretching of the polymer matters. And then um, we want to think about gels, where we've got this extra thing about cross-linking, because many of the, the systems in, in, in nature are gels. Now, um, I'll just finish by showing you what we're doing at the moment, and just started doing, which is worrying about this idea of things on the lining of the stomach, where you have loads of polymers there, and you're saying, how are particles getting to the lining of your stomach? Because the same sort of simulation is going to work beautifully for this. Here are my polymers, and those are my particles. And that particle is getting through the polymers very easily. So what we did is we tried to increase the size of the polymers, and the particles got through very easily. We're cheating here. We've got gravity on. I know you don't have gravity. Well, I suppose you do have gravity in your stomach, don't you? But it's probably not very important. But you do have a uh, flow. We just wanted to vaguely see what would happen. If the polymers are rigid, it still gets through. If we increase the density of the polymers, it does get through. But I, yes, that's it. That gets through as well. <coughs> Couldn't stop this thing. OK. And eventually, yeah, I think we t this is with cross-linking. The red bits are where you get the polymers cross-linked. That didn't help either. And eventually, I'm just going around the bend with this, OK? He added cross-linked and increases the bending rigidity. So now you have very stiff polymers which are cross-linked, and we stop the wretched thing. But this was just to play to start with, um, because we've got an awful long way to go. But I think this method is perhaps the first way anyone's had of really trying to model how these particles get across these mucus layers uh, and, and perhaps start to try and answer some of the questions in a physics-y sort of way. So um, those are my conclusions. I'll show you the little movies there happily. Um, thank you very much for listening. And we've got one more brave person who is going to come and give uh, a, a talk. But he wants to use his, his own laptop, so I 
rather meanly put them at the end so we can only change over once. Okay, so I'll be around the rest of the conference and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone's got to say and seeing people's posters and things. Okay, can we, excuse me, can we change computers? <laughs> it's going to work. Right. Tell you something about my special kind of colored particles. So it is magnetic yellow particles. This is my PhD work and the background about organic electronics. So uh, organic electronics are widely uh, used today, and uh, it uh, provides uh, flexible alternatives to the traditional electronics. For example, all light display can uh, have higher contrast ratio and a larger view angle compared to light. Display also the organic solar cells, normally are low cost and lightweight compared to traditional silicon uh, solar cells. And uh, the how to fabricate the organic electronics? So, the basic method is solution processing. For example, inject inkjet printing. So, in inkjet printing, the liquid with dissolved functional materials is deposited on the substrate. After solvent evaporation, the solid. Uh, the solid um, uh, functional materials will be left on the substrate. But uh, the goal is to achieve a uh, well-defined structures, and uh, to uh, to achieve this goal, we need to ha we need to have better understanding on the physical mechanic mechanics, such as the uh, hydrodynamic flow and the particle particle interactions, and uh, also capillary interactions. So in my PhD project, I focus on the uh, capillary interactions between the particles. Here's an example in nature. This is a, a beetle larva is a kind of insect which uh, um, is unable to walk on the water. However, it can uh, achieve its bags that deform the interface. This generates a capillary flow to push the push the insect <laughs> up the meniscus. However, the colloidal particles are normally dyed and the colloidal particles deform the interface due to its weight or its uh, anthropic shape. So how can we actively control the assembly and the patterning on the particles? And uh, here we can see there are special kind of colloidal particles. You see, we can see the particle, this particle has two hemispheres with opposite light ability. So the upper sphere, the red color, you see it is uh, hydrophobic, and uh, down the, the lower hemisphere is hydrophilic. And the beta angle, uh, represents the biting ability, biting ability difference between the two hemispheres. And uh, we consider a magnet dipole inside the particles and we apply a magnet field parallel to the interface. We perform computer simulation to investigate the system. We model the fluid with 3D multi-component lattice the methods and the particles are discretized on the fluid lattice and uh, modeled with a molecular dynamic Algorithm and the su substrate is modeled as, as a solid, and we introduce fluid structure interaction between the fluid and the substrate. So when there is no magnetic field, the particle will take, uh, take uh, an upright orientation. However, if I switch on the magnetic field, so the particle will rotate. The particle will deform the interface due to the, uh, in order to reduce the total free energy of the system. And we also perform theoretical analysis on the system. We develop a, a free energy model to uh, calculate free energy as function of the tilt angle of this particle. And we compare our theory with the simulation data. We found this, the, you see the, in the right picture, you see the um, dashed line in the theory without deformation. And the solid line represents the theory with considering the interface deformation and the, sim the simulation data and the symbols, so we see that the theory uh, with interface deformation agrees better with the um, uh, simulation data. So we see also the, the free energy of the system depends on the tilt angle of the particle. And we can uh, control the tilt angle of the particle with the magnetic, magnetic field, thus we can really change the interface deformation just by varying the magnetic field. And with two particles at the interface, the particles they will, uh, fit, uh, they will fit each other and uh, the interface introduced, uh, the interface deformation introduced by neighboring particle overlap. This will generate capillary force. And we see this uh, capillary force 
this uh, uh, interface information is in dipolar uh, shape. So one side on uh, the interface and one side of the particle is deep rise. And uh, at another side of the particle interface is raised. So there's a dipolar shape. And then we also developed the capillary first theory for this kind of system. And our theory has a good agreement with the similar data in the limit of small tilde angle. What happens if we have multiple particles at the interface? So we see here we randomly distribute eight particles at the interface and we turn on the magnetic field. It's the particles they already do two separate chains, and these two separate chains they move relative to each other, and the color represents the interface energy. So now the, particle, the two chains they move closer to each other, and finally they will uh, join into a long straight chain. So this uh, chain structure can be uh, can be turned by varying the length field. And up to now, we, uh, we consider <coughs> so the particle at flat interface. But uh, in reality, we know the interface uh, normally have some degree of curvature. Then we uh, now put the particles at the job lead, at the job lead interface. Now this uh, left figure shows the top view. You see the for three to six particles, the particles they favor hexagonal arrangement instead of chain-like structures at the flat interface. And for this system, we also uh, we divide the free energy for the system and the free energy predict the, for the for such particles they favor uh, hexagonal arrangement. So it's different from the flat interface case. <coughs> and then now we begin to learn how to how can we reloc reloc relocate these particles by varying the direction of direction of main field, pointing upward at first, then downward, then left. I show this movie. So first, the magnetic field is upwards. The particle they move to top, and uh, from a hexagonal, hexagonal <coughs> region, then we turn the particle, the field to downward. Particle also will go to the edge, and then we turn the field to left. The particle they move to left. This we show we can direct the assembly of the particles at the job interface just by varying the direction of magnetic field. And finally, we we study. This uh, the, this uh, job lead is undergoing evaporation, which is also quite a uh, uh, common scenario when when drying field <coughs> and also when drying the uh, suspend job lead. So with an upper main field, the part of this stay at the top, and they uh, they arrange into hexagonal structure, and finally a uh, dried uh, highly ordered model layer is left on the substrate. When uh, the magnetic field downward, it's the particle they stay at the edge of the drop lead. And finally, a ring like deposit is formed. And when the magnetic field is left, uh, is left then we see the particle they move to the left, and the particle will pin also the counter angle. So here you see the, 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 the counter, counter line on the right side, they, re, they recede, while the counter line on the left side keeps pinning. And finally, a loser party arrangement is left on the substrate. So we show now we can actively, actively control the particle deposition by varying the magnetic field direction. And now I come to conclusion. So I show that we can use one single magnetic particle to generate a tunable interface deformation. And then with two particles, we can change the capillary interaction between two particles. And then finally, we can form some uh, tunable chain like structures. Uh, when magnetic particles is at a job interface, we can direct the assembly of the particles at the exact location of the job lead interface. And when the job is dry, is dry, then we can control the particle deposition. And the, uh, so the, all the, uh, the <coughs> further work will be about the magnetic ellipsoid of young particles. So ellipsoid particles will have an extra like, uh, f degree of freedom. This uh, the orientation of the particles will affect the interface deformation modes, and we can uh, get more complex and more beautiful structures for, from from episode of young particles. Hey, so you can go and do Eric's experiments.
<laughs> Any questions? Um, which part of the organic electronics are you interpreting? Uh, um, so where are you interpreting those particles in, like for the organic electronics? Oh, so when they the fabric to the electronics? Yeah. When the fabric of the electronic devices, yeah. so they deposit the this uh, droplet. See so the droplet on the substrate. So in the, the particle that dissolve in the droplet, the droplet dries, the particles yeah. will arrange to some. I mean, is it for like the screen yeah. itself, or uh, like you set all the to the yeah. other applications? Is mm -hmm. it for the screen itself, or is it? So the oh. all, all like uh, this uh, yeah. is organic uh, lighting emitting diode uh, technologies. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I use to fabric some screens. The screen can be flexible. Can so have it's like in between the sc screen. I know this the uh, screen have different uh, layers. Yeah. So yeah. it's like in the screen. So yeah, in the okay. screens. Yeah. And what size is your in this particle? Hmm? What sizes are in this particle? Uh, what what size? What size? Yeah, it's the particle itself. It's typically so micrometer. Yes. Good. Well, thank you. Right. So, Big Grand, Eric and Pepin, all of which I apologise for my pronunciation. <laughs> but thank you very much indeed. We're very brave to talk and it was very interesting. Lovely. Well done.